that God's people have had influence all throughout the years, all throughout the centuries and generations. God's people have had great influence. It's one of the things that really marks the people of God, uh, uh, apart from every other people on the planet, is that God's people have had this divine influence given to them. And in Joshua chapter 10, we find the people of God, the people of Israel, they've been given influence. They signed a treaty with this this tribe of people called the Gibeonites. And when they signed this treaty with them, they said, hey, we got your back. We'll be there for you. That's what the people of God said. We said, we'll take care of you. You ever need us, you come calling on us. Well, sure enough, very shortly thereafter, the five tribes or the five kings of the Amorites got together and they began to declare war on the Gibeonites. And so they came calling to Joshua. They said, where is his card at? He said, call if we ever need him. Joshua! (laughs) I mean, they were like, we need your help. We need you to come and help us out. And so we pick it up in Joshua chapter 10, starting in verse 4. And the scripture says it like this. Come, help me attack Gibeon, he said because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. That's the the, the leading king of this, this advancing army. It says, Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, there you go, Eglon, joined forces. And they moved up with all their troops, and they took positions against Gibeon to attack it. The Gibeonites sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly. Save us. Help us. Because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. And then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. And so after an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. Israel Israel pursued them along the road, going up to Beth Horon, and cut them down all the way to Azka and Machadiah. As they fled before Israel on the road from Beth Horon to Azka, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky, and more of them died from the hailstones than were killed from the swords of the Israelites. On that day, the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel. Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon. O moon, over the valley of... That one. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. I've entitled our message today, get to work, get to work. Let's pray as we listen to God's word. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you how you work on behalf of your people. And God, we pray that as you give us influence, God, that you would give us the ability to walk in your ways, to hear your word, and God, to go the direction that you call us to go. God, I pray that we would be actively involved in the work that you've called us to as a church. And God, we give you all the glory and praise. It's in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I, I'm still kind of c- captivated uh, by some of the ideas that were shared uh, on social media last week as we were celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And one of the quotes, and I shared it last week, but it just really grabbed a hold of me this week as I was studying. And it says this, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? It's just one of these questions that just keeps coming up in our lives. What are you doing for others? 
What are you doing for others? It's life's most persistent and urgent question. It's really, it summarizes the teaching of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said all the law and the prophets are summarized in these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so here it is in Joshua chapter 10, and now the people of God experience experiencing God's blessing. I mean, they are inhabiting the promised land one step at a time. They are going forward. Kings and armies are dropping. Walls are falling down. I mean, they are going to town. They're having a great time. And all of a sudden, there's someone in need. There's someone who's outside of their family, who's outside of their church, who's outside of their tribe, this, 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 this tribe of Gideon, or Gibeon outside of the people of Israel. And so now they need some help and they say, hey, can you come down here and help us? They're, they're, they're answering this call. How are we going to love the people who are outside of really any connection that I would normally have with people? What do you do when you have an opportunity to love someone who can't really do anything for you? I think that's really the true test of spiritual maturity is understanding that I get to a point now where I can do things for people who can never do anything to benefit me, but because I'm following Jesus, that's who I'm called to be and what I'm called to do. In verse 6, he says it like this. He says, do not abandon your servants. Come, help us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. See, Israel has now become the big man on campus. I mean, Israel very quickly, guys, went from a nation of slaves in bondage to the Egyptians. And all of a sudden, God has exalted them to such a high place of prominence and influence that now they have all this ability and now people are saying, hey, can you come and help us? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that who we are as the church of Jesus Christ? We were rescued from a life of sin and addiction and pain and bondage and hopelessness. And now we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And now God has set us into a place of influence to the nations, of influence to the world, where now the people are on the earth are coming to say, hey, come and help us. See, the people of God have always been a force of blessing to the earth. That's who God has been raising up. He's been raising up people to be a blessing. In fact, God says this to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. He says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. We could just stop right there, a lot of us, and we could say, man, that's it right there. That's the call that I want, man. I want to be a great nation. I want my name to be great. I want to be blessed. Then he goes on to say, he says, and then I will make you a blessing to others. You will be a blessing. See, God sends us to bless others. He gives us influence so that we can influence others with the life and blessing that comes through Jesus Christ. And listen, here's what I found. If you get a lot of blessing in your life and you just hold it all to yourself and you just spend it all on yourself, guess what happens? you become very, very not blessed anymore. You become miserable. Some people are tormented. They have so much for themselves, but they're not sharing or giving or blessing anyone in any way, and they find themselves in miserable positions. You ever heard of people who who commit suicide and they're filthy rich? You're like, are you kidding me? You have everything. You have fame and you have wealth and you have health and you have everything you could possibly need why would you ever do something like that it's because they haven't experienced the blessing of being a blessing to the life of someone else if you're taking notes write this down a life with purpose begins and ends with serving others every person wants to have a purpose to live with They want to have some driving force behind them, something that wakes them up in the morning, gets them out of bed and says, man, it's going to be a tough day, but boy, do I have a lot of purpose and drive and energy and motivation. I can't wait to tackle the day, even though it's going to be filled with a lot of challenges because there's purpose involved in it. And purpose, a life of purpose, it comes 
from serving others, from meeting the needs of others. And see, that's why volunteering inside the church, it's more than just a good thing to do. It, it fulfills your purpose. It, it gives you something that you can come and say, yeah, that's why I worked all week, so that I can come and I can serve people at church. So I can come and I can help meet the needs of others because that's why I got through everything I had to do today because I get to do something for others through God. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says it like this. He's talking about salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says. He says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That's, that's a good doctrinal statement about how we get saved through faith in Jesus Christ. We believe he went to the cross and he died 2,000 years ago, took on his body our sins, and he nailed them to the cross. And so now we are free, forever free. We are never able to be held down by shame or guilt anymore because God has set us free. We are God's people, completely and totally His. But then it goes on to say this in verse 10, very, very, very connected to this. It says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So, so here's the thing, we're not saved by what we do, because we're saved through faith in Jesus Christ alone, but we are saved to do something for God. You understand, we're not saved by doing something, we're saved to do something. That's the purpose. God wanted to redeem us, he wanted to set us apart, he wanted us to fill us with his Holy Spirit so that we could influence and impact the lives of the people around us. I like to say it very simply like this, we're saved to serve. We're saved to serve. We're saved to serve others. We're saved to give our lives away. We are saved so that we can be a blessing to others. We're not saved by works, but we're saved to works, to give to others. And we have a very simple process for people who might be new to living water or have been around living water for quite some time but have never had a chance to really step out and find the joy that comes from serving others. And I asked Pastor Tidra, our Next Steps pastor, to film a short video to explain to us how we can take that first step towards finding a place to serve right here at Living Water. Take a look. Hey Living Water, I'm Tidra, the Next Steps pastor here. And I was just thinking, how many people come to Living Water wishing they could be more involved? Maybe you've been thinking about becoming a member, but you're not sure how to do that. Or maybe you want to join a serving team, but you don't know which one to pick. If that describes you, then I would love to invite you to the Inside Track. The Inside Track is a two-week class designed to connect you with God, the church, and your purpose. We meet the first two Sundays of every month during the 11 o'clock service. You can sign up online at golivingwater.com, or you can sign up at the Next Steps area located right outside the auditorium doors. We're expecting so much growth this year, and we would love for you to join us and be a part of that. So what are you waiting for? Let's go. And the next Inside Track class is going to happen on February the 4th, Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, right here on Sunday morning, you just come to the 11 a.m. service and just attend during the 11 a.m. service. We have a kids ministry happening just like normal, so you have no reason not to come to Inside Track. It's going to be a great time. There's some light refreshments there, some friendly people. You can get signed up today at Next Steps, or you can sign up on your app right there if you want to. But we want you to know that you can have a place to get involved right here. Now, this is why this particular Inside Track is really important. If you want to become a member and vote, in our annual vision meeting. We have a once a year business meeting as a church. I'd love to get more new members involved so that you could be a part of our voting body. You can come to Inside Track on February the 4th and you can vote in our uh, first uh, meeting of this year on February the 11th, which is gonna be our annual vision meeting. So I'd love for you to be there if you can make it to our Inside Track on February the 4th, okay? So we're going to keep right on with this passage right here. And after the people of Gibeon said, hey, Joshua, come and help. It says this in verse 7. 
It says, so Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including the best fighting men. And the Lord said, that's a good passage right there. That's a good phrase. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them, for I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. What has the Lord said to you about this year? Not, not, not your, your resolutions or your goals or your dreams for this year. Those are really important. I think you should do that. What has the Lord said? You need to get a word from God for this year. You need to, for your family, you need to seek God and say, God, I need a word. God, what's the direction you're taking our family this year? God, what's the word that you're giving to us this year? A word from God can change everything. A word from God, one word from God can change everything for you. Before Joshua went to this battle, he went and sought the Lord, and the Lord said, hey, don't worry, Joshua, I got you. Man, I'm going to take care of this. You want to talk about confidence walking into that battle. You need confidence in your life this year. Walking into the things that you're going to face, you need to know God's got it. God's working on your behalf. He's fighting the battle for you. You know, we've been praying for the church, and I believe that God gave a word to me for our church. I believe the word for our church is influence. This word influence, God wants to give influence to our church. And you know, influence has little to do with the size of anything. You know, when you get the flu, they say it's like a microscopic organism. Just a little tiny, can't even see it with your naked eye. You don't even know it's going in. Got the flu, it's coming. Man, it influences you in a big way. Man, it shut me down all week long. I gave it to my kids, y'all. I felt so bad, man. I, you, know, you, know, you know that every single child that attends my children's school all got the flu? Well, they're homeschooled, and they both go to my house. So... I guess, it, I guess it wasn't too hard, but. See, the influence of even something small can influence something great in a huge way. You know, there's a lot of problems in our country right now. There's a lot of problems in our communities. There's a lot of problems in our schools. There's a lot of problems in a lot of things that are going on. You know that God can give our church influence and through that influence that we can make an impact in those around us, even though we might be smaller than the thing that we're facing, God can anoint us in a powerful and amazing way. And I believe that God's given me this word. I'm praying for influence. I'm praying that God would give us divine influence this year and that we would be able to make a huge impact for the Lord. So what has the Lord told you? What, what has the Lord said to you? What's the word that God's given to you? Because Joshua got a word. Man, Joshua got a word from God and then he acted on it. See, faith in God's word produces action in our lives and we begin to do something in accordance with how God's speaking to us and then we can start experiencing the miracles that he has projected would happen in our lives. See, you might hear from God, but if you're not willing to obey God, it's meaningless. If you're not willing to do what God says to do when he says to do it, his word has no effect in our lives. And so we need to get to work. I mean, we got to get involved in the game. We can't be on the sidelines anymore. We need to get in the mix of this thing because you were born for this. You were born for the influence that God wants to put on your life. You were born for this moment when you can serve and impact others in a powerful and a real way. You were born for this. And I want you to see this because in verses 9 through 15, it does this amazing back and forth between God working and how the Israelites were at work as well. And it was this amazing back and forth. You even see it in this passage starting in verse 9. It says, after an all-night march, that's getting to work right there, guys. That's working hard. They, they said, okay, we're coming. God gave us a word. Let's start going. And they marched all night. It says, after they marched all night, Joshua took them by surprise. But then notice this. The Lord then threw them into confusion before Israel. And then Israel defeated them in a great victory. 
And then Israel pursued them along the road and cut them down along the way. And then the Lord, he hurled hailstones on them from the sky. And then more of them died from the hailstones than from the swords of the Israelites. You see this? That God and the people were working together. It was, it was literally like the people took a step and then God took a step. And then the people took a step and then God took a step. It goes back and forth. And I think the writer's deliberate because that's how it is when we walk in the Spirit. That's what it means that we keep in step with the Spirit of God, that God is working along with us. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, Paul the Apostle, he actually breaks this down for us and he gives us this illustration. He says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. See, see, we take a step and then God takes a step. That, that's what it means to stay in step with the Spirit is keep moving. When God's moving, you keep moving. When you keep doing something. When, when God's not moving, you take a step and then you pray and you ask him, God, why don't you take a step? God, why don't you get involved? Why don't you do something here? And man, they had an all night march. I, I did research on this. It's 20 miles up, steep terrain with gear, under stress, at night with a battle to come the next day. You want to talk about working hard? Man, they were doing it. They were working at it. See, God's not calling us to something easy. Working with people, serving people is hard. It's hard work. It's long hours. It's times of prayer and asking God, I thought you said these people were going to be influenced by me. Now they're not. They're not going anywhere. Nothing's happening. God, I need your help. I'm going to pray hard. I'm going to ask you to do something. God, I'm not going to give up. I know that you've called me here. I know that you've called our church to do something. God, I'm not going to give up. Loving people's hard. And it's a fight, man. They were fighting a battle. You know, the Bible talks about our faith life being like a fight. Paul got down to the end of his life. He's writing to Timothy. He says, I fought the good fight. Well, who's he fighting? Why are we fighting all this fighting? What's happening here? I mean, there's a good fight that God's called you to. A fight against the work of the enemy and a fight against the work of your flesh. You know, this internal fight is really the greatest fight that we have to overcome. If you and I can overcome this internal battle with our flesh, I guarantee you everything else will fall into place. Man, it's not going to be easy, but I'm telling you, if you can overcome the flesh fight, that's the fight that you and I need to fight against. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, right before it says, keep in step with the Spirit, he gives us this clue on this fight that we're fighting against the flesh. He says, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature or the, the flesh. He says, the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict or fighting against one another so that you do not do what you want. So there's this conflict. There's this fight. Let me illustrate it with like a, a little science experiment. I've got a couple rubber bands here. Now, a rubber band, if you pull it back, it has what we call stored energy inside of it, okay? Or potential energy. You know, this potential to, ah, okay? It's potential energy. It can, it, it's stored up inside of each of the sides of this rubber band that's right here. And so when you want to shoot, okay, I'm going I'm to risk it here. I'm going to shoot this out in the crowd, okay? So don't, nobody put your eye out, okay? Okay, so when you shoot it like that right there, okay? Where'd it go? Did it land somewhere over there? Did I go pretty far? Okay, good job, good job. Oh, I made it all the way back here, okay, okay. So when you do that, what happens is when you pull it, when you let it go, these two sides of the rubber band, they're, they're fighting against each other. They're in conflict with one another and they're preventing it from going as far as it could because they're wasting some of that stored up energy. Instead of putting in a kinetic energy and making it go far, it's, it's using up some of that energy with this internal conflict. You know that God has put some kinetic energy in you or some potential energy in you through the Holy Spirit. He says, I give you power from on high. So you've got this 
this power that's inside of you, that's resident inside of you, but sometimes, come on, you're fighting this war against the flesh on the inside of you, and sometimes you're expending some of that energy fighting and warring against the flesh rather than going and soaring and doing what God's called you to do. So here's what the scripture says then. It says, be led by the Spirit. When you're led by the Spirit, guess what happens? Your spirit begins to lead your flesh, and like this rubber band, instead of wasting all of this energy by just bouncing off one another, you're now being led where now one side of the rubber band will lead the other. And so I'm going to try this. Now, this is supposed to work. A little science experiment. Let's see if I can make this happen, okay? So if I pull back one side of the rubber band tighter than the other side, it should fly further. Okay, let's see if it goes. Okay, it did not go further that time, which is why I brought another rubber band, just in case. Okay, let's make sure I can do this, okay? Let me get it going here, okay? I'm going to pull it back as far as I did this last one here. Okay, here we go. Let me see if I can shoot it. There we go, okay? And it, it didn't work again, okay? But you could see, you could see, that's just because of user error, Okay? The idea is that the rubber band's supposed to lead it. One side's supposed to lead the other side. And because it flies through the air with one side leading, it's no longer fighting against itself and it's able to go further. You understand the way that the Holy Spirit's designed you and I to work is that we're led by the Holy Spirit. See, when we give ourselves over to the leading of the Holy Spirit and not to the flesh, what happens is, see, a lot of us, we focus on our flesh. We focus on those things that we're not supposed to do. We're like, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Oh, man, I did it. And we're wasting all this energy doing this. Instead, let's focus on the desires that the Spirit has. Man, the desires of the Spirit, He wants to lead us into peace and He wants us to serve others, man. So let's get involved in doing God's work. When we're led by the Holy Spirit, we're going to begin to do things that the Holy Spirit is pleased with and we're going to begin to serve others. Because see, your flesh wants you to serve you. The Holy Spirit wants you to serve others. And so when you take the focus off of only serving you and you put your focus on the Holy Spirit's desire for you to serve others, you're going to find yourself having influence and making an impact in people's lives. Because here's the thing, if we as a church want to do things that we've never done before, we have to do some things that we've never done before. Here, in the life cycle of any organization, there's a beginning point, there's an ending point, and inside the life cycle of this organization, it just kind of goes up and it goes down. Well, see, as, as this church is over 40 years old now, we have to be careful that we don't just slide into this place of complacency because, well, I've served before and I'm going to let somebody else do that now. See, that's why church planting is such an effective way to reach new people. It's because when there's a church plant, everybody knows, hey, I've got to get involved because this thing is not going to go anywhere unless everybody's involved. But see, when we kind of get into a place like this where we got a nice building and now we're launching apps and we're doing all this kind of stuff, surely we got more than we need. And man, they don't need me to get involved. And I'm telling you, as a church, we're at a place right now more than ever before. We need everybody involved. We need you to lean in when the pastor says, hey, join a serving team. Man, we want to impact people's lives. Listen, we've got big vision for this year of how we're going to impact our community, how we're going to impact people that walk through these doors, how we're going to expand to a third and a fourth service, how we're going to start thinking outside of our doors and how we can plant either churches or other campuses and other cities and communities because we want to be a church that's impacting the world. We're not going to just slowly just fade away and just say, you know what, we, we've had our day of influence. Our, our greatest days are behind us, and now we're just going to kind of ride it out till it's in. No, 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 no. We've got more. God's got more for us to do. He's got more influence for us. It's time for us to get to work and get involved in God's activity. The passage goes on with this amazing miracle that the sun stands still in the sky. They were working so hard. They had such a harvest that they were going after. They had so much bringing in that, they, that God actually stopped the sun in the sky from going down about a full day so they could get it done. How many of you have been a Friday in your cubicle and you're like, God, 
stop the sun so I can finish my work. Nobody said no one. This is literally what the Israelites are doing. They're like, God, you've given us such a great victory. Stop the sun in the sky because we want more opportunity. That's the kind of church that we are. That's the kind of prayers that we pray. We pray things that are impossible because we know that God is able to do the impossible. God's going to give us such a significant amount of of influence that we can impact and, 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 and bless other people. I want us to pray for that kind of miracles. That's the kind of place that we want to be. We want to be that kind of church, but we're ready for God to do more. I'm praying for that this year. I'm praying with that for your families. I'm praying for that for your businesses. I'm praying that we'll experience God's blessing, and because of God's blessing coming in, there's not room enough for us to contain it, and so we've got to give it away. We've got to bless others. We've got to do more, and we've got to be here. We are this kind of church. And so I just want to say thank you for praying with us. Thank you for fasting with us. Have you been fasting over the last few weeks? I thought for sure fasting would have exempted me from the flu. Like, I thought for sure God would have been like, man, they're fasting. I'm not going to give them the flu. I'm excited. I'm excited about what God's doing. I'm excited about how our faith is going the next level. And I'm excited that God's calling us up. I want to pray with you today as we close and uh, dismiss to our app launch party. Would you pray with me today? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that when you've given us a word for this year, a word for our family, a word for our businesses, a word for our church, God, that we can trust that you're leading us. And God, I pray that you would give us divine favor as we embark upon this great mission that you've called us to as a church. God, that this vision We continue to expand, reaching more people and expanding so that we can see a harvest of people coming to know Jesus Christ and finding salvation. God, I pray that you'd raise up workers. God, raise up people who are going to get to work with us and experience God's best. And God, we thank you for it. It's in Jesus' mighty name.